invent a number i such that when you square it, you get negative 1. You're inventing the complex numbers. But you could also invent a number j such that when you square it, you get positive 1. And what are you inventing there? The split complex numbers, and which also have many other names. And we can wonder, why are these split complex numbers not nearly as uh, well known or studied as the complex numbers? Uh, and why would I be interested in them? Which is because I want to learn bot periodicity. I want to understand how different number systems are fitting together. I want to know how they may be modeling the divisions of everything, the way we put perspectives together in our mind. I am Andrus Kulikowskas. This is Math for Wisdom. So we'll be talking about split complex numbers, which have the form x plus yj, where j squared is a 1, and we simply are appending or adding or inventing this uh, j. x and y are real numbers, which you hopefully are familiar with. But what I want to talk about is how we can think about these in different ways. So one is that uh, this is a Clifford algebra. And other examples would be the complex numbers and uh, the quaternions, uh, and uh, there are many more. So that's one way to write it out. And then we might use, I'll be using the notation epsilon 1, uh, where epsilon 1 squares to 1. We'll also want to think of them in terms of a direct sum. Uh, reals plus reals, where the elements would look like a comma b. And this on the one hand, it's isomorphic. It has the same structure as uh, the Clifford algebra. But on the other hand, it's not trivial how you convert from one expression to the other expression. They're like in different languages. The way you can see that is that in this Clifford algebra, what would be the identity? What would be the... Um, unit that uh, the multiplicative unit that uh, is basically your one well it would be x equals one y is zero okay so that's what you would multiply uh to to have the identity whereas in the case of the direct sum it would be one comma one so right there you see there's a difference and so you have to be very careful how you map over it we'll do that but also what we want to do today is to talk about how to express this as a matrix algebra, where matrices are uh, expressing actions, how you're acting on a vector space or a module. And so x, y, y, x is one way we'll be doing that, but you can also uh, diagonalize it. So you can have these uh, eigenvalues, x plus y, x minus y, We'll also show how you can do it with larger matrices, which in a sense uh, re re reflect this A comma B structure. So why don't I go through all my notes just so you know what we'll be doing. Well, we're making, uh, I'm, I'm giving this for typical participants in Math for Wisdom who maybe don't have uh, too much of a background in mathematics uh, uh, or maybe they're, high school teachers, let's say, uh, or college students. Uh, so we'll just review what the real numbers are, and we'll review uh, different uh, uh, algebraic structures like groups, vector spaces, rings, algebras. And then we'll compare the split complex numbers with complex numbers and dual numbers, where the uh, number you invent, epsilon, squares to zero, let's say. And we'll talk about how that affects the geometry. And then we'll explore this goal of mine, uh, bot periodicity. How is this R plus R, and you can see C here, how are they all fitting into this uh, collection, this eight cycle 
of um, mathematical systems, Clifford algebras. And I'll talk a little bit about why that's uh, important for me philosophically. And then we'll focus first on the Clifford algebra. Given a Clifford algebra, how do you get a matrix structure? So this is this x, y, y, x. And then we'll talk about a direct sum. What does that mean, really mean, direct sum? How is that uh, uh, acting uh, algebraically? And then we'll talk about simple modules of R plus R, which basically um, you can think of abstractly, but you can also think of, uh, they're kind of like uh, vector spaces, let's say, a generalization of vector spaces. And then we can um, express those uh, in terms of matrices. So we'll talk about the isomorphism from the Clifford algebra to this R plus R, and you basically can see it. Uh, oh, right here, X plus Y, X minus Y would, um, in the direct sum, would be the expressions that correspond to X plus Y epsilon 1 in the Clifford algebra. And we'll talk about decomposability. Uh, why is it uh, that split complex numbers decompose when you have a two by two matrix? It'll decompose into here, this, uh, uh, these two diagonal entries, whereas that won't work in the complex numbers over the reals. So that helps explain why complex numbers are actually in a certain sense uh, uh, fundamentally important. Um, uh, in the way that the split complex numbers are not, why they're telling us something more, so to speak. But on the other hand, in Clifford algebras, uh, they do play roles like brother and sister, you know, like siblings. And so then here will be the matrix algebra, and uh, the uh, we'll be talking about two, uh, here it's projections, or two um, irreducible modules, and that's really a, a key goal of this uh, exploration, is to understand uh, why something that looks like R plus R is going to have two different um, ways of representing it with matrices, for example. And that's basically because when you have A comma B, you can focus on the A or you can focus on the B. Uh, so, but that's that doesn't... <laughs> There's more uh, to it um, in terms of actually being able to say it very uh, concretely. So let's start. Uh, we'll start with the real numbers. Just to say um, uh, that the real numbers include the integers, the whole numbers, you know, so they include zero, they include minus one, uh, they include all the fractions, uh, but they also include uh, square roots like square to two. Um, they include include um, what are some examples of transcendental numbers like e and pi. And basically, they in include any kind of decimal sequence uh, going off as far as you can, uh, all the way to infinity or towards infinity. And so the real numbers, um, uh, they form what's called a field. Okay, so let's just dive into some of these Wikipedia pages just to remind ourselves what it is. So just like I was saying, you could invent a number. Well, you can invent an, a mathematical system, let's say. And so one way to do it, um, a field is basically a mathematical system that has all of the things that we like to do with numbers uh, in elementary school, which would be we can add them, we can subtract them, we can multiply them, we can divide them, okay? Uh, except for you can't divide zero, but basically uh, otherwise everything fits. So you'll, um, we won't go too much in this, but things like associativity. So the addition, so there's the point, main point being that there's two operations. So the first one would be called an additive group, which is addition. So you have certain expectations for additions that that's associative, like A plus parentheses B plus C will be the same as parentheses A plus B plus C. And you have that for multiplication too. Uh, that basically what that's saying is that parentheses don't matter. Uh, in a field, you'll have commutativity where the order doesn't matter which one comes first, A plus B or B plus A, A times B or B times A. You'll have identities. So that's a zero when you're adding, zero won't change anything. And one when you multiply, one won't change anything. You have additive inverses. So if you have a five, 
it's kind of like taking five steps forwards, there's a way to undo that. You know, you take five steps backwards, let's say. And if you multiply, let's say you make something twice as big, there's a way to shrink it. Um, do you multiply by two, let's say, you can multiply by one half to undo that, to shrink it back to normal. So there's these two potions. If you make a potion to get bigger, there'll be a potion to make yourself smaller and vice versa. Um, and then, um, but you won't have that for zero. Okay, that's a special uh, thing to worry about, how it comes together. And then distributivity, how do they play nice? So like, if you multiply a sum, so A times the sum B plus C, it's the same as multiplying each of them and then adding it afterwards. So they fit nicely. This is just reminding for uh, some people who know and kind of introducing for people who don't know uh, that there's this whole world. Uh, typically, we spend uh, a year um, in um, as mathematics majors uh, studying what's called algebra. And so algebra is... Um, the study of the possible mathematical structures, what could go wrong. So, for example, so we're going to be talking about uh, how to extend the real numbers, okay? And so we'll see, sometimes uh, you can think of R to the N. So R2 would be the plane in two dimensions. R3 would be the three-dimensional world we kind of think we live in. Four dimensions uh, possible, five, as many as you like, let's say. And we think of these, uh, one way to think of these as vectors, okay, like arrows, okay, in the, on the tabletop, in the plane, or from the corner of the room, there could be these arrows. How do you add arrows? Uh, that's, uh, you, you point them, you add them together. That gives you uh, one operation addition, which is a group, and that happens to be a billion, uh, typically. Uh, so uh, a group is... Um, uh, and it could be like rotations or manipulations of all kinds. Typically, you can think of them as actions. So when you, these are the things that, first of all, if you have two actions and you combine them, you should get another action. Okay? You do, you know, you do this first, do this first, like instructions. You have two instructions, do this instruction first, do the instruction first, you get a new instruction. And in a certain sense, you can add any of these two actions or instructions uh, you're allowed to um combine any of them okay so not that's that's a that's an assumption there that you have to satisfy so that's um, that's essential for being a group but also like we had this associativity the parentheses shouldn't matter the identity element which we typically um often we write as well, e or sometimes one but in the case of addition we use zero and then the inverse element saying that there's a way to go uh undo something. So let's say if you add three, you subtract three. If you add um, a vector, you can uh, have a, a vector that's going in the opposite direction. And then for commutativity, again, uh, it shouldn't or matter what order you add these two vectors, you know, if the first one and the second one or the second one and the first one. So in here, like if you have two dimensions, uh, you could use, you could write out a coordinate for one point, which you can actually think of, you start from the origin, you get a vector, but you could just think of it as a point. And another point, you can add them together, uh, adding the X coordinates and adding the Y coordinates. Okay. Uh, and so one way to think about this uh, that I like to teach uh, even as a tutor for um, high school students uh, or even elementary school students, uh, is that every answer is an amount and a unit, okay? So uh, the unit would be like the dimension. So an example would be like uh, three feet. A feet is the unit and three is the amount. And this is something I learned uh, as a physics um, bachelor student, um, at the University of Chicago, there's a lot of emphasis on dimensions. You know, if you know what the units are, if you know what the dimensions are, then you know what we're talking about. Is it distance? Is it, uh, are we measuring time? Are we measuring mass? Uh, is it uh, distance per time, which would be a velocity? You know, is it distance times distance? These are the types of things. And so when I was teaching students, I said, hey, uh, this is a very powerful thing. Like, so Seven is not an answer, really, <laughs> for anything. Seven what, right? So uh, typically, you know, like uh, seven uh, euros or seven dollars, it makes a difference. And uh, 
uh, if you want to, um, uh, you know, it could be 7 million. So then the millions could be the units. And so then the question is like, well, what mathematical system are we working with? But um, then you have these principles like add like units, like so 7 million plus 2 million is 9 million, but 7 halves plus 2 halves is 9 halves. Uh, 7x plus 2x is 9x. So that's what, once you get this basic principle, like that's uh, very powerful. So here, um, the vector is kind of like the unit, and then the amount would be the scalar. So in a vector space, and that's that's basically what we're calling a vector space. So like we could say, we're going to talk the x, x direction on the x-axis. Let's say we'll have a unit step. That'll be a vector. And then we could have five of those. So it's five of steps to the right, let's say. And then it could be four steps going up. Those could be the unit vectors in the y direction. And we can add five to the uh, right, let's say, and four up, and that's some um, vector, a uh, two-dimensional vector. And then you could multiply that uh, by two, you could double it. So then instead of five to the left, it'd be 10 to the left. Instead of four up, it would be eight up, okay? And so when you double something like that with a scalar, you're doubling each of them. Uh, and you have to be very careful about the mathematical system you're working with. So when you have a vector, when you double it, you double all the components. But you could have something like a tensor uh, product where when you double the tensor, you're actually only doubling one of the components, which could be any of the components. And so think about area. Like if you have a rectangle, See, if you double both, you're going to get four times the area. If you just want to get twice the area, you could double the length, you could double the width, either one. You know, or so you could change the shape of the rectangle by, let's say, dividing uh, by two in one dimension and multiplying by two in the other dimension. You're preserving the area, but um, that's that's a, just a different that's the logic that's appropriate for area and likewise let's say for volume okay so uh that's um that's about vector spaces and scalars and now it could be um and so then this question is like how do you um multiply units okay you can start to see like um in area like you have a, a distance times distance right that um, that's um, we're kind of used to that, but let's say what does it mean to multiply time? You see, like one dimension time, the other dimension time. It's not clear, but yeah, that comes up in like uh, acceleration. So velocity is distance over time, but um, acceleration is distance over time squared. Or um, maybe another way to think about it is the change. The first change in the distance is the velocity. So then the second change, the change in the velocity would be the acceleration, okay? So it makes you wonder, these are, this is where like philosophy starts to enter into these types of things. Um, and more abstract algebra, you may be familiar with uh, vector spaces and see, so now what you can do, uh, we've kind of snuck in a scalar here, but we could even sneak in multiplying vectors because this is really just scaling vectors. But if you take two vectors, um, so scaling the vectors is just changing the amount. You know, was it three feet or was it six feet, let's say. But how do you multiply feet times mass? What is that, let's say, right? So now you're multiplying dimensions or, or vectors um, and so, uh, or units. So, um, that's what a ring is. It has now two operations. It has addition and multiplication, okay? So you have to, uh, and so it kind of looks maybe like some of the th like things we saw with the field. So a field is an example of a ring. It's a very nice, uh, uh, well-behaved example of a ring, but the rings don't have to be so uh, convenient or, or uh, friendly, let's say. They can be a little bit more on the wild side. So, but the addition will always be nice, basically. It'll be a group, but it'll even be an abelian group. Abelian groups are um, uh, very well understood. Um, the classic abelian group is the integers. So it's just counting, but you can also count um, minus. Okay, so so from not negative infinity to positive infinity. Uh, but the other types of, uh, so that's an abelian group with addition, but another type of classic abelian group would be um, 
a clock, okay, like a 12 hour clock. You can add uh, two o'clock and three o'clock will be five o'clock. Uh, you could go five o'clock uh, plus five o'clock is 10 o'clock, but you could go 10 o'clock plus four o'clock and now you end up on two o'clock, you see. So 12 o'clock is basically like zero. If you add 12 o'clock, you're not changing anything, okay? So a uh, 12 hour clock, you could have a seven hour clock uh, and you can start to build these different clocks. But that's about as complicated as abelian groups get um, unless you do strange cardinalities, let's say. So um, you have this, It's uh, and those are commutative. Um, yeah, that's the abelian is another word for that. Uh, so, and you have your zero. So, but now there's a, under multiplication, there's an operation which need not be a group. So the reason it's not a group necessarily is that it may not have these inverses that we like to have. You may not be able to undo an action, okay? And so like you have a dimension, you may not be able to undo it, let's say. Um, and so uh, rings, uh, if you have experience with vector spaces, then rings um, can um, help... Um, well, basically, you can try to apply some of your intuition. You have to be careful and you see, but they, they can serve as a bit of a guide. So they'll have the, the multiplication will work out. It'll be uh, associative. There'll be a unit element here. And then um, it'll be distributive uh, with respect to addition. So that means that they work nice uh, in the two ways. So multiplying a sum will give you a sum of the multiples. But also, if you have a sum and you multiply that times something, it'll work. It works, I guess, in either order. That's the point. Left distributivity, right distributivity. Okay. And now what an algebra does, an algebra is kind of like combining this whole ring thing with the algebra, where you, with the vector space thing where you're scaling. Okay. So now you introduce a whole scaling where the scalings are coming from typically a vector, I mean, a field. Okay. Although sometimes uh, we'll work with, let's say, uh, you could have uh, quaternions as part of your algebra. And so then the field was commutative in terms of the multiplication you, where the order didn't matter. But like you could do things in the quaternions where like, hey, you have to pay attention to the order. Like I times J equals K, but J times I would be negative K, that type of thing. Okay. So this is just kind of warming up uh, for people who know algebra or people who don't. But let's start looking at concrete examples. So we have a split complex number that I've already explained. And so the notation we can use sometimes is Z equals, uh, that would be the split complex number, but it has two dimensions, two components. So it's X plus Y, J. Uh, X and Y are coming from the real numbers. And uh, this J squared is just a number we invented or imagined, it's equal to one. Okay, and so you get two dimensions. Um, one plus, um, plus um, so it'd be like x times one plus y times j. Okay, and uh, let's just, we can look at the uh, Wikipedia article on that. They have lots of synonyms. And so that's kind of like a sign that these things keep cop creeping up again in different situations, but not enough to where it would, everyone would have agreed about the numbers for a long time ago. Uh, so, so here you here you see uh, tesserines, motors, hyperbolic complex numbers, biral numbers, real hyperbolic numbers, all the way to the split binarians. Okay. Um, the split part, I'm not quite sure, but I think what happens is that when you have a number system, and then you would make one into two, you know, and but you may have several dimensions. Maybe you have ten dimensions, and you want to get. 20 dimensions out of that. So for each dimension, you might break it up like that. And this is um, this is basically, and here they're talking about the thing we're going to get to, like x plus y, j in the D, the D is, let's say, their notation for split complex numbers. How are we going to convert that into r plus r, or what they write like here, r squared? So x comma y, or like x plus y, j, basically is going to become not x comma y, but it's going to become x minus y, x plus y. And we'll see what that's all about. So I wanted to compare that. Um, okay, and so then 
also just to say like sometimes you could write it x plus j y that's not going to hurt anybody uh that'll be um uh that it depends on the the friends you have the crowd you're hanging out with and the books you're reading we can think of it as e equals x one where i've put it in bold to say that you could think of the one as a vector and you could think of the j as a vector okay and let's compare this with complex numbers as we did from the very beginning i squared will be negative one so we have x plus y i and there's dual numbers so x plus y epsilon epsilon squared equals zero of course, epsilon does not equal zero. That would be the assumption, because uh, if it was zero, uh, it would not be very, well, we're not really doing anything very new. Also, like, basically, what with the j squared here, we're basically assuming, you know, of course, you could say, oh, j equals one, right? It's just another name for one. Well, then that'll work. It'll, everything will work, right? But um, the assumption basically is that we're not doing that. Also, like you could uh, say, well, j equals negative one and j squared or negative one squared would equal one. Then that'll all make sense. OK, but uh, we're not going there. We're not assuming that we're assuming this is some alien came to Earth. Right. And it's 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 the usual people plus the aliens. So this is basically two dimensions. These are all like two dimensions in that way. So that's why mapping it out on a uh, tabletop or on a plane is very uh, understandable. And as I mentioned, you'll have, well, I really want to um, understand split quaternions, okay? And then there are uh, things, oh, I'm sorry, I want to split, understand split biquaternions. That's the one I want, H plus H. That's where I'm going. So this is a way for me to get walking on that uh, mountain path. Um, split octonians, split quaternions, but I'm not really sure that this split is actually very uh, uniformly applied. Let's look at the geometry of these different kinds of numbers. That'll give us some intuition. And we'll start with the complex numbers uh, because you may be familiar with that. Let's say you have 2 plus uh, 3i. So uh, in the complex plane, we would say uh, x is 2 and then uh, y is 3 on the i-axis. And so that's 2 plus 3i. Now, what happens if we multiply this by i? Well, um, the 2 will become 2i. So instead of referring to the x-axis, now it's going to refer to the y-axis. And the 3i, when we multiply it by uh, i, it's going to become negative 3. So it's going to be on the x-axis, but it's going to be going in the negative direction, okay? And so it's going to uh, rotate it. And actually, this looks like 90 degrees, and it is 90 degrees, because what we're doing is we're taking the, let's say, x, and we're rotating it over so that it becomes vertical. And we're taking this y equals 3, and we're rotating it over to be negative 3. So they're both rotating 90 degrees in the same direction. So the whole thing is going to rotate uh, 90 degrees. And then you can see that if you do it twice, you'll get negative of the vector, which is what you'd expect because i squared is negative 1. So if you think of it, i as an action, it's rotating it um, 90 degrees, and then you'll rotate it again. And if you did it again, it would be 270. And if you did it again, it would be uh, all the way around. It would be doing nothing, which is basically like multiplying by 1, which means that i to the fourth equals 1. And here, uh, this makes it very clear, too, that uh, if you think of i as the action of rotation, well, then there's just as good an action that rotates in the opposite direction. That's the complex conjugate. That would be negative i. But the negative is very misleading because really, uh, it's not like uh, it's any less profound or important. You know, the other one could have been called the negative. You know, this the, the, the clockwise one could have been called the positive one. Then the, the counterclockwise one could have been called the negative one. So they're really like uh, identical twins, a very important thing to realize about complex numbers. So now let's look at the uh, split complex numbers. Here we have 2 plus 3j. What happens if you multiply by j? Well, the 2 will become 2j. The 3 will become, the 3j will become 3 because j, 3j times j is 3j squared and j squared is 1. So that'll just be 3. So going over by 2 
is going to become going up by two. Going over by three is going to become going up by three. And so if you think about it, you're actually reflecting across the y equals x axis, which goes at 45 degrees here. So you're reflecting across. If you did it again, you'd reflect it again. You're going, hmm, why is it reflecting again? And in a certain sense, this x became the y, you see, when we flipped it over. I mean, the y for this one. And then the y became the x. So you're kind of like flipping uh, which is which. That's what we're doing. The x's will become the y's, and the y's will become... The x's will become, the, the, the distance will become the height. The height will become the distance. So if you flip it back twice, you get back to where you started. So there's no, there's they're actually kind of like rotating in opposite directions. Um, so that's how this works. And now with the dual numbers, um, if you have 2 plus 3 epsilon and you multiply by epsilon and epsilon squared is 0, well, the 2 will become 2 epsilon. So 2 steps over will become 2 steps up. But... If you multiply three epsilon by epsilon, then the three will just go away. So you won't uh, you won't have anything. You'll just be left with this two epsilon. So this is basic introductions, just so you start to feel like what is complex numbers. But like now we're going to talk about like why I'm interested in them, and that's a philosophical question about um, uh, trying to understand human experience, the meaning of life. How would you model that, right? And so. A typical thing that's happening in the philosophical structures that I work with is you say, well, how do you think of the mind as pulling together some basic perspectives like free will and fate, let's say, or you you take a stand, you follow through, you reflect, there's this kind of learning cycle, or you have four levels of knowledge, let's say, whether, what, how, why uh, you would do something. So uh, in each case, you have this idea of mental perspectives or it could be choices, you know, but in math, we talk about dimensions. Okay. And so how do you add one or more mathematical dimensions? What happens to that? And so we're going to uh, look uh, at a fabulous thing. Uh, in my thinking, there's uh, eight cognitive frameworks, which keep getting more and more sophisticating, you know, starting with like zero, zero perspectives, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it collapses. The eighth one would collapse down to zero. Uh, so when I started, uh, I have a PhD in math, but when I started uh, looking at that again uh, in 2016, I was studying Lee theory and I became aware of this bot periodicity and I go, huh, that's an eight cycle, which is very you know, fundamental for math. So is it the same eight cycle? You know, is it modeling what I've been uh, documenting in the experience of human life, these mental states and operations on those states? Well, so those operations may be like basically like what happens when you add a dimension or add two dimensions or add three dimensions? What happens when you add a perspective or a perspective on a perspective or a perspective on a perspective on a perspective? Kind of like adding the first person, I adding the second person looking over your shoulder, let's say you, adding a third person looking at from the side, uh, they or other, that's what that'll be about. And so in order to understand bot periodicity, which is not uh, so easy as it should be, I think, <laughs> we need to learn about these different structures. And so um, we need to uh, look at them also in three different ways. One is Clifford algebra, and this is called a Clifford algebra clock, so to speak, how you how you look at Clifford algebras, especially for the real Clifford algebras, but also division algebras. So there's certain number systems that are uh, so fundamental, and one of the features that they have is that um, you... Um, uh, well, they're algebras, I guess. So like you have this notion of scalars, like multiplying by the reals, but you also have addition and multiplication. And in the multiplication, you have um, you have uh, divisions always making sense. There's always an inverse uh, multiplying. There's always fractions, okay? And in particular, you don't get a situation where like non-zero things would multiply to zero. So with a clock, a 12-hour clock, you have a problem that like 6 o'clock times 2 o'clock is 12 o'clock, which is 0 o'clock. And well, why is that a problem? Then you really 
can't, once you have something like that, you can't have something like a half a clock, okay? Uh, something that would say, well, get one, like two o'clock times what would give you one? You see, it's not going to exist uh, once you have something like that. Whereas if you had a seven hour clock, or even a two hour clock, like an on and off switch is like a two hour clock, let's say. Those are cases where, because they're prime numbers, two is a prime number, seven is a prime number, but 12 is not, 12 has divisors. So if you don't have these divisors, you won't run into that problem. And if you do like division by, um, you know, with these seven, I don't know if they do or not, but like every single number from, um, zero to one, two, three, four, five, six. So don't talk about zero, but let's say, so uh, you'll be able to figure out uh, how uh, something times something will give you, let's say uh, seven, because seven is zero. So like one times seven will be, let's see, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> That's for another video. But the point is, is that division algebras, uh, so the real, the complexes, the quaternions, those are very important. Those are key. They have all these nice properties. Uh, uh, and then matrix algebras are important. Matrix algebras are, um, how do you think of these as acting on um, a vector space? Okay, so a matrix is an action on a vector space. And so that, because the vector space is like a column, and so the matrix will be a square acting on that column. That's something that we have to learn about. And there's a video I have on just multiplying two by two matrices. So I would make more exercises like that if there was interest. So, and then we'll uh, look at how to build these up. And that's kind of like why I'm learning about this. Uh, uh, you can see that the R plus R um, is part of this cycle, but so is H plus H. The way we're going to typically do it, probably for my philosophy, is probably the relevant way to go. Is you, when you have real Clifford algebras, you can keep adding a generator. Okay, so like if you add the i, which squares to negative one, that will give you the complexes. But if you add two such numbers, uh, two generators, that'll give you the quaternions. It'll turn out. Um, if you multiply those two together, you'll get a third dimension. And then if you add one, you get four dimensions. So you have to be careful about, mindful about things like that. But basically, like as you keep adding a number, inventing a new dimension, let's say, where that number squares to negative one, you'll be going around this way. If you, Whereas if you add one that squares to positive one, you'll be going around uh, that way. So here, R plus R is kind of like the alternate universe, you know, compared to the complex numbers, okay? And so um, why don't we just, and so here's the direction though we're in, that the numbers get to have more and more dimensions. R, C, uh, C is two-dimensional, R is one-dimensional, H is four-dimensional, H plus H would be eight-dimensional. Then having two by two matrices of the quaternions, I think that's 16 dimensional, four by four matrices of the complex, four by four is 16, complex is two, so that's 32 dimensions. Eight by eight of the reals, that's 64. Then you do it twice, you get 128. When you get to 256, it turns out that the whole thing collapses. I mean, in the sense that it's basically the same as like R. Okay, and so these are things I'm trying to master, trying to understand. Um, but again, like when you do it philosophically, it's just not obvious, you know, how your model, let's say, will fit, if at all. Like it could be like after spending several years on this, I'll realize, you know, it just doesn't match I've my structures or something else. So, but maybe it starts at C. There's something special about the complex numbers, you see. And the reals and the quaternions, uh, they kind of like match up with each other, so to speak. Um, and sometimes we ignore the size of the matrices. So why don't we just, because I'll feel better, we'll dive into this understand bot periodicity. You can watch this video, um, which where I explain, does it model consciousness? Preliminary exploration, right? And then you have all these uh, Lie group structures uh, to think about. And uh, this is the pattern that we're trying to, I'm trying to decode. Okay, so when you look at homotopy spaces of spheres and things like that, or, you know, homotopy spaces of homotopy groups of this uh, O infinity, which is like rotations in all kinds of dimensions. Uh, 
uh, you get this uh, sequence Z2, Z2, 0, Z, 0, 0, 0, Z. And this Z is uh, coming related to this H plus H, these biquaternions, split biquaternions. And so really that's kind of like why I'm trying to understand the R plus R very well, because uh, I'm trying to understand where does this Z come from, okay? And so just dashing through here, uh, the types of things. Oh, so this is the the divisions of everything that I'm trying to study, like how it, how the mind carves up mental space into dimensions, or it could be like the global workspace. Let's say that the the brain has a model of itself, right? And it's saying, okay, this part of the brain is doing this, this part of the brain is doing that, this part of the brain is doing this. That's that means that we're in a learning process because let's say we're taking a stand here, we're having hypothesis over here. We're uh, allowing to do the experiment over here. We're going to be checking on the results. What do we get? So we can break up, carve up space. So here's here's the ABCs of that. Um, and then uh, it just goes on and on and on. And, and so this challenge. And so John Baez uh, uh, gives wonderful talks and he, he's a, he likes this subject too. So we have that in common. I gives talks on the symmetric spaces. And uh, you can keep see this R plus R is coming in here, right? How does R plus R compare to R? So I think that that's like where the Z comes in. It's kind of like two copies of the integers divided by one copy of the integers will leave you with a copy of the integers. I think that's what's happening. So I need to learn with you what's going on. Here's maybe a good thing to say. The Clifford algebra generators, you see, R is generated by one, just itself. But C has two generators. It's well, it's it's this one, and then you have E sub one, or like normal people like us say I, let's say, but square of this is negative one. Then you could have the square root of another one of this, two generators. So in the quaternions, this would be called I and J. If you multiply them together, I times J is K, that also happens to square to negative one. Um, but when you uh, keep adding generators, now you have three of them, so you can look at them individually. And this is for H plus H, so that's very very similar, I think, to R plus R, just more complicated, more dimensions. So you could look at one at a time. You could look at none of them. That'd be this one. You could look at pairs of them. You could look at all three. Okay, And so the more you add uh, the rules for the multiplication, because... Um, E1, E2 equals negative E2, E1. And so when you keep that in mind and you so when you swap them over, you're going to um, change the sign. So then this idea that they square to negative one, let's say they may start to square to positive one, et cetera. You get this. And the basic, one of the main ideas is to say like, this is modeling the types of choices we can make and that when we make so much choice with our brains, there's only so many choices left. Okay, it's not like you can just have independently many choices. Like, there's a limit to the size of the brain, maybe like an eight-track mind. Okay, and then um, where we're going with this is, in order to hook up these type of philosophical thinkings with the physics or metaphysics of bot periodicity. Well, bot periodicity comes up in physics, uh, in uh, condensed matter physics. Um, what's a subject called topological insulators. And they're talking about the symmetries in materials. And if you have certain symmetries, you can get exotic behavior. But basically there's three key symmetries, which would be uh, charge conjugation, par parity or chirality and time reversal. So charge conjugation is saying that a particle and a whole, are they the same thing or not? Like if you have a electron, versus having a hole in a positron uh, C, okay? So there's a missing charge. Is that the same as having the opposite charge, right? Because, and there's many situations where basically like a missing charge is kind of like acting like um, the opposite charge, like the, ne the negative charge of the electron. Uh, so that's a question where it depends, basically it, it, there's, it can go either way. Um, and depending on how everything's set up, um, what the and depending on what the symmetries are, whether 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 there is that symmetry or whether there's not, 
uh, parity, chirality is saying that, oh, oh, and just so philosophically, you see, it really is about like something being and something not being are those two different things, right? Is a whole, you know, is a whole a thing, let's say. Can you say that a whole is, there is a whole, you know, really? Like, is that the same thing as saying there is a brick, right? Like, that's a philosophical question, and this is dealing with uh, different ways of uh, resolving that uh, philosophical question. Another one is like if you had a mirror universe where everything was the same, but like in a mirror. Well, it does make a difference. So taking a stand, following through, reflecting that learning cycle. Imagine if it was the opposite. Like you took a stand, then you reflected, then you followed through. It's kind of backwards. It shouldn't make sense. It shouldn't work. So in physics, certain things uh, don't have opposites. Uh, sometimes that, uh, the, and many things do. So again, um, uh, and then time reversal, like is going forwards and running it backwards the same thing? Well, if it is, um, you know, if, if, if you have the same uh, things, basically it's like uh, time is not passing and there's no becoming. Okay, so there's no how, it just is. <laughs> Whereas if 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 you have a direction to time, I think then these ideas like, well, there's a how, there's a why, right? That, that makes uh, more sense. So that's where we want to go. This uh, today is just a step in that direction. Um, and then we'll have geometries. We'll, we'll have these types of rotations. This is, uh, this is what makes it exciting for me. And that's why I'm sharing this. Uh, oh, okay. And so... This is technically what we need to be. We need to be able to calculate, let's say, what are called representations or matrices. So when I spend energy time on these two by two matrices, you see, and we get something like for the complex numbers, you can get like A plus B I will be A minus B B A. Um, and so then if you say, well, um, I just want to look at the A's. I don't want to look at the imaginary. Then just set it to zero. Then you see, oh, but if I set it to zero, this breaks up. You see, you could think of it as breaking up into two one-by-one one modules. There's no anti-diagonal uh, elements. There's no crosstalk. Like this one and this one are doing their own thing. They're not affected by each other. Okay. So uh, the focusing on just um, what's called the even ones and not the odd ones, uh, because uh, this is called like zero generators. So that's that's uh, it's just real numbers. Once you add like this i or you add the j, that's the first generator. So those would be called odd. But if you multiplied like i and j together, that could be like a, an even generator. It's double. But then if you did it again, it'd be triple, like that'd be odd again. So you have this what's called a grading that separates those. And then you can wonder like, well, if I only focus on the even ones, uh, does it uh, allow itself to be kind of unraveled, you know, or, or decomposed, right? And sometimes yes, sometimes no, and depending on how, then you get this little, uh, you get this little, um, I guess, group basically that uh, explains the possibilities you have there and how things build up. And so we're trying to calculate that. Okay. So even here I say Z arises, like I mentioned, because R plus R has two irreducible representations. So we want to understand that. Okay. So. And this is all uh, for bot periodicity. Typically, it's based on like where these square to negative one. So you don't see R plus R here. But if you did the ones to positive one, you'd see R plus R. And then you'd see two by two matrices of R. And I think then you'd see maybe with the complexes uh, and then the quaternions, it would be kind of heading out in that direction. So and then there's these recursion formulas. So this is you need to know in order to know how these things build up. Um, some of them, you know, you the the ones that squared a negative one, the one that squared a positive one, actually, when you build up, they kind of uh, you use either direction to build up either direction, um, the kind of bootstrap on either side. So R, R plus R, because it's one of the very first Clifford algebras, it's going to be uh, important for that. So that's a lot about, and here's the formula that I'll be needing to try to calculate where you're looking at these representations and going back and forth, how they're embedded and what you end up with. So that's a lot of motivation, uh, which is maybe not enough if you're interested in bot periodicity, but more than enough if you don't care about bot periodicity. So that's where we are.
So now, uh, and these are just tables uh, where it's showing that the R plus R is coming up or the H plus H, or, or it could be like, instead of R plus R, it could be eight by eight matrices of real numbers. And so again, you'll have similar types of issues come up. So now we're all ready, we're motivated, hopefully, or over-motivated uh, to talk about Clifford algebras. Um, and uh, so all of these number systems that we had, like they were some of them, the complex numbers were squaring to negative one. Um, our friend of the day, split complex numbers squaring to positive one. The dual numbers are, are squaring to zero. Those are all key for Clifford algebras. And I think the deal is that if, if, if they were more or whatever, then... Uh, you could just divide away and get it down to plus one, minus one, zero. Uh, the crucial thing uh, is that this is all about real Clifford algebras, and they're the ones that have the eightfold complicated pattern uh, where they go around and then they, they, um, they then they start repeating their behavior. Um, uh, not repeating it necessarily in terms of the actual matrices, but if you look at what's called Morita equivalence, like you say, hey, I'm gonna not worried about all the in, inner algebraic machinery, like the gadget, but I just want to see like how do these types of things relate to each other, et cetera. What are the maps, the homomorph, what do the maps reveal? The maps will not, you know, when you go eight eight steps around, then it looks like you never left, okay, from that point of view. So we have a long way to go to make sense of that, but that's what we'll do. And then dual numbers are uh I just hear like part of exterior algebra. So for the real numbers, um, negative one and one uh, make a big difference. You see, with complex numbers, you could just scale it. You could just change your complex numbers. And so um, if you multiply by, if you sneak in an I, you know, then uh, if you multiply by I, then let's say uh, X squared equals negative one. Yeah, but I just, if I have a scalar I, I X times I X, I squared is negative one, X squared is negative one, together they're positive one, so you get positive one. So complex numbers are just uh, uh, able to cover all the ground, uh, but real numbers aren't able to cover all that ground. So then they get segregated in this way. The pluses and the minuses uh, are segregated, makes it more complicated, okay? Just trying to get some intuition uh, that I can share with you. Um, so, Let's see, we had those three ways we wanted to look at them. Oh, so CL one comma zero, the one is saying, uh, and this always depends on notation, but saying uh, sometimes they put the negative ones first. So it's saying we have one generator that squares to negative one. So that'll be Clifford one comma zero will be the split complex numbers. If it was zero comma one, it would be the uh, complex numbers, okay? And then the dual numbers, uh, that's called degenerate, right? You saw, you saw how to kind of just smash down. It's not, not those are ignored, not dealt with, exiled. So banished. So let's see how to convert this into matrices, okay? So the way you do it is, you, and you're kind of thinking about this in two different ways. You're thinking, okay, this is like a vector this uh, split complex number, u plus v epsilon one. So it could be like two plus three epsilon one. But now I wanna see how it looks like as an action. So let's say I multiply by epsilon one. What does that do as an action? Well, the u, it's gonna become u epsilon one. So I wrote it over here. And then when epsilon one times v epsilon one, oh, epsilon one will square. So that'll just give me v. And so you can kind of see what it does. So epsilon one times u plus v epsilon one is gonna to equal to v plus u epsilon one. And it's basically swapping it. So if you're familiar with, hopefully, uh, with matrix multiplication, or now here's your chance to learn, um, this uv is a vector, a two-dimensional vector. And then this will become vu, they're swapped. And how do you write the matrix that swaps them? Well, the way matrix multiplication works is that the row multiplies times the column, and that'll give you this entry here. So zero times u plus one times v. The zero times u goes away, the one times v becomes v, that's v, I write the v in here. Then we do the next row times the column. One times u plus zero times v, 
Well, the one times u is u, and the zero times v is going to go away. So we just have u. So you see, zero, one, one, zero is going to swap it like that. Okay. But that's um, so what we need to do is we need to get the action for every single uh, element of the basis. So in the basis, this is a two dimensional system. So one um, dimension is given by the regular real numbers. And you can just think, well, how does one work? How does the identity work? And we know how it works. It uh, just doesn't change anything. So one times u plus v epsilon one equals u plus v epsilon one. So you get the ones on the diagonal. Okay. And so one, th th that's just classic uh, identity matrix. Uh, however big your matrix is, you just write ones on the diagonal. And so one times u plus zero times v is u. Then you do the next line, zero times u plus one times v is v. And you see nothing changed because of how these are positioned, right? Whereas these were positioned to swap it. So we have two dimensions, we have two actions, and then you can have more complicated, you can have basically, you can have um, compositions of these actions. So let's say, you know, you can put this together. You could have, let's say, x of the ones plus y times these epsilon ones. And so then the way we would do it, if you add this x times one, one, zero, zero here, one, zero, zero, one, it'll be x, x. The y times this, it'll be the y on the anti-diagonal. And so when you see how that acts on uv, you go, okay, let's multiply x plus y epsilon one times u plus v epsilon one equals. So we get now, uh, let's do, well, and you can actually multiply it out here. It's just, um, the FOIL method, right? Like, so X times U plus uh, X times V E epsilon one, Y epsilon one times U, and then Y V epsilon one squared, that'll be Y V. So this Y V is here. The X times U is here. These don't have an epsilon one, but this one had an epsilon one, Y U, and then X V has one. So X V plus Y U, those have epsilon ones here, right? Of course, it's commutative. You can write it in different orders, but... That's what's happening here. So let's just see how it works with a matrix multiplication. X times U times Y plus Y times V is X times U plus Y times V. That's here. The second row, the second uh, element, Y times U plus X times V is here. I wrote it like that. Y times U plus X times V. Okay. So that's what it looks like, right? And if you put in a zero here, you would see things would go away, right? If you put a one for the X's, you would get back here, this. If you put one for the Y's and put X zeros for the X's, you'd get back this. So I like to do checks like that. That's uh, that's good. So what we're, we're making progress. Uh, we knew what the Clifford algebra uh, looked like. Now we're seeing what these matrices look like. Okay, that's a gen there's a general form. That's basically can be called a matrix representation. Um, you have to be a little careful, like what are we talking about? But it's a um, matrix, uh, it's an algebra representation in terms of matrices, right? Over the field, let's say the real numbers. And so that means that you not only are you multiplying, but you're also adding. You can, this will work with addition, this will work with multiplication. And it'll even work with, uh, if you multiply uh, by a scalar, let's say like if you double this, that should also work. And I have to wonder what happens if we double this? Um, if we double it for this to work, when you double a vector, right, like you multiply, let's say two times the top, two times the bottom, you have to do both. And so into the matrix, you have to multiply them all because that's how we would, well, we would have to multiply all of this or we could multiply the vector here, right? So you could go 2x, 2y, that would be 2xu plus 2yv, right? Or you could just uh, multiply the U and the V, this part, you see. So you really have to be careful like how this whole logic works. Uh, now we're going to do another way. Uh, that's This is really the crucial one because this is the one that's going to show that this actually has two representations, okay? Two different ways to uh, represent it. And what we'll see is that although this looks like, this was the one that's easy to get, but this is gonna break down into two. Okay, and you're going, how does that gonna how could that happen? How could because it, it looks all tangled up here? So the direct sum example, okay, so what's a direct sum? It's saying that you can have um pairs of numbers that kind of like are in sync, they're working together. And 
there's different ways to talk about it. Maybe the one I'm more used to is like you can have um, parentheses, you know, A comma B. Okay, so that's what I have here. A comma B plus C comma D. You can combine it. You just the first one. They're like segregate. It's like a duplex, right? Like this family's here, uh, this family's here. Uh, in you know this family's here, this family's here. They they add. I'm sorry. A and C are one family. B and D are another family. So you add up A and C. That's going to be A plus C. You add up B and D. That's going to be B plus D. They keep segregated. They're not really. Uh, they don't. They don't uh, talk to each other. They maybe not even aware of each other. Let's say. But but we're aware of both of them. Okay. So you can do it by just segregating them that way. But another is to use these uh, units or, or dimensions. So like five hours plus 43 minutes and two hours plus 12 minutes. Well, you can add the hours, add the minutes and just keep them segregated. It'll be seven hours plus 55 minutes. OK, so there's a way in which you can actually think of this as adding things. OK, or sometimes you can just think of it as segregating things. So then one thing to notice is that what does zero look like, right? Zero looks like uh, zero comma zero. It means that in each compartment, nothing happens, right? So a comma b plus zero comma zero is going to be a plus zero comma b plus zero, which is just a comma b. And then you can also have multiplication by a scalar, okay, as you would for a vector product. So like we we're saying, you could double them or triple them, but then you'd have to write it out for both of them. Um, just like you could double the five hours plus 43 minutes. Of course, then you would get 86 minutes. We're not uh, carrying over. Still, that's that's probably valid in its own way. So you have to be comfortable with things like that. Then with the product defined this way, this direct sum is actually a product in category theory. I read that. So the whole notion of a direct sum, like uh, here it was a group, here it was a vector space. Like you have to kind of like in the fine print, let's say, and sometimes you have to read the fine print, you know, what is the direct sum defined as? And it's very sometimes boring to go through all the fine print, but when you really want to understand something, you have to... And so then you recognize strange things like what's called a sum is actually what in category theory would be called a product. Let's say when you uh, when you uh, do the product, where the product we're going to define it as like a times this c is a c, b times d is b t. Again, segregated, right? Uh, but so that actually works as a, what's called a direct product, um, or in general like a product in category theory. And I have to be very careful what I say because uh, so easy to go wrong. So um, this is not my um, field of expertise. This is why I'm learning this. Uh, uh, I had a graduate uh, year in algebra, abstract algebra. I, I, I passed the qualifying exam. So that's pretty much a, And I did algebraic combinatorics, but uh, that tend to be very concrete usually. So now identity looks like one comma one. Okay. So when you multiply um, the way you don't change it, you know, you have to have a one in both slots. So this one takes care of the A, this one takes care of the B. So that'll be A comma B, and you could put it in the other side and it'll work either way, okay? So that's how direct sums work. Now, how do you get the simple modules? This is getting kind of like advanced and I had to spend some time thinking. But then John Baez helped me. Oh, that was very nice that uh, he, um, he stepped in. I, I basically confessed that I didn't know how to do something. I didn't. And he said, what are those two simple modules? So he just did it very, uh, we just go here and just be welcome. So here I'm at the category theory Zulip chat. It's a nice interface. Uh, and uh, if you get uh, uh, included, joined, then you can uh, do this. And here, well, John Baez, the two simple modules of R plus R are these. In the first, R plus R acts on R as follows. A comma B. Uh, on C equals AC. In the second, R plus R acts on R as follows. Yeah. It's very terse, very much to the point. Uh, and so here I am uh, working on bot periodicity, okay? So let's go back. And so, but I've uh, changed a little bit of notation here. I'm calling it C1 and C2. And we'll talk about, uh, and I had to actually be a little bit even more pedantic than that because I have to really understand what's going on. So C1 is a module, and it, as being a module, it's a set, okay? And um, it's kind of like a vector space. Now, so for a vector space, you would have a field, let's say the real numbers, which are the scalars. 
So in the case of a module, instead of a field, um, although you could use a field, but more generally speaking, you can use a ring, okay? So here we're gonna think of this R plus R as being a ring. And even we could think of it maybe probably as an algebra. And then it gets kind of <laughs> very, have to bring in the lawyer, the math lawyers to say what that's all about. But um, so this is first of all a set and it has a generator C1. You see, he mentioned C there, but actually the C has two different meanings, I think. We'll call it. On the one hand, you can pick what I, I'm doing, a C1, a little C1 here, that'll be the generator. And we're going to show that once you have that generator, if you're using R plus R as uh, your uh, ring, okay, then there's a certain minimum amount of stuff that you're going to get uh, generated, right? Like, so if it's free, I guess I should have added, right? Like where you just, you're not going to have any kind of uh, other relations or anything. So the first one says, okay, when I take a scalar from R plus R, this ring element, it's going to look like A comma B in general, where the A could be seven, the B could be negative pi, let's say, whatever they are. But you're going to apply that to the C1, and then it's going to be A C1. Okay, so, uh, and, uh, this will be, hmm. Okay, we're, we're basically, so we're going to include any real number here. I guess that's basically what we're saying. Like, so any real number times the C1 is going to be part of our module. We can get them anyway. You know, B doesn't really matter, but we're all picking up an A. Okay, so you can have, once you have the C1, we're saying you can have a, 7c1, you can have negative pi c1, you can have uh, 10 to the 3 c1s, but all the real numbers will work here, okay? And with c2, it'll be very similar. We'll have a generator, but we'll be using this b, okay? So what do we need to show? We need to show that these are abelian groups. Um, this is definition of module, and that they satisfy the rules for modules. Okay, so first of all, if you have these ring elements, A1, B1, A2, B2, and if you have module elements, M1 and M2, we need to have that A ring element times the sum of the module elements is going to distribute like this, okay? And also, like, if you have two ring elements and you're adding them and you multiply times, a, you have them act on the module, it'll do like that, okay? It'll distribute like that. Then if you have two uh, ring elements, uh, one multiplying on the other in their ring, so you have multiplication, and then you act on the module. It's the same as saying, well, act with this one, and you're acting on the left side of the module, so you act that way, and do that first, and then you'll do this one later, okay? So it, in a certain sense, it's kind of like associative. Uh, these are, I'm saying modules, I mean uh, left modules, technically speaking. You could imagine the whole thing happening on the right side, and then at that point, you start to wonder, well, what does this have to do with math notation? You know, because we're writing things out linearly. What if we lived on a different planet uh, where the, you, know, you have a different piece of medium? It's not necessarily flat paper. It could be, you know, four-dimensional systems. And so then you get a different kind of math. You know, is, is, is this, how, how natural is this? Well, it's a question. So, and then you have a unity, uh, you have this identity, one comma one, okay? Axon M1 just gives you M1, okay? Now, what we want to do, we want to show that every element of C1 has the form RC1, okay? Where R is an element of R. And likewise, every element of C2 has the form RC2. But this, I think you'll grant me that one. Now, note that given two elements, R1, C1, and R2, C1, addition and scalar multiplication, likewise, yield elements of that form, okay? So, we want to show that everything will look like RC1. You see, when he said it looks like this, it acts like this, I'm saying, okay, you can look at that C, I call it C1, as the generator, but you could also look at it as an arbitrary element. But then we have to connect the two. You know, So we'd like to be able to say that, um, what we'd like to say is that uh, here, C1 is an arbitrary element, and when you hit it like this, then this will be defined like that, okay? The reason I don't start with that is because I don't know 
maybe there's all kinds of hidden dimensions there. We're trying to find simple modules. Oh, so I have to explain maybe what a simple module is. Um, I should have maybe done that earlier, but we're trying to think of these modules. And of course you didn't know what a module was, but it's kind of like a vector space. Okay, so we'll do it a little bit by analogy, like a three dimensional vector space, uh, let's say R cubed to be more specific or a two dimensional uh, uh, vector space R2, let's say, they can be broken up as direct sums actually uh, in terms of R, okay? So it's like R plus R or it's uh, R plus R plus R. And so then you're getting different things going on. And what that means is that uh, you can have um, actions which break up into the components, right? And so the component that it breaks up in, like, so it's reducible into these components. But once you have a one dimensional thing, that one dimension is not going to be reducible anymore. Because as soon as you have a unit and you can multiply by real numbers by scalars, which you need to be able to do if that's your uh, algebra, let's say that's your scalar. And I guess maybe that's the point with R plus R that I was got stuck a little bit. Like we're assuming these aren't just um, modules, but that they're that there's this algebra. These are modules of algebra. So then they have to be able to uh, play nice with this scalar. Uh, action. So I probably haven't uh, written those uh, axioms in there. Uh, there's probably more axioms there, but maybe you'll let me just uh, skirt that. So the point being that you get the whole real number. So if once it's one dimensional, there's no way to kind of like uh, uh, break it down further, let's say to the integer steps, because you take the integer steps and you'll multiply it by uh, whatever real number you want, and then you'll get including uh, the, the real numbers. Uh, so um, we need to uh, show, okay, so basically like if we just assumed, um, oh, like we want this rule to hold and let's just assume that it's a little bit problematic for different ways, but one is like, we don't know that we're gonna get what we want, which is, oh, that it's a simple module. Simple means it's, it's irreducible, it doesn't break up anymore, okay? And we'll, we'll make it more concrete. This is the abstract part. So, we can then just uh, run through here and we run through in our concrete case. Okay, like if you have this A comma B uh, acting on C equals AC, we're gonna get all these things. And what you'll notice, and I won't go through this maybe in the gory detail, but what you'll notice is that when, because we're only picking on the A, you know, we're, we're using the A, as we go through here, well, let's just do one just to kind of say, a1 comma B1 times uh, M1 plus M2 equals A1, right? It's only the A1. Well, A1 times M1 plus M2, and this is in the algebra. This is a scalar. We know how that works. Uh, that's uh, A1 times M1 plus A1 times M2, right? So distributivity works uh, because of that. Well, then we can climb back out and say, well, A1 times M1 is A1 comma B1 dot M1. So we recover this, right? Um, of course, we had to remember what we were doing, but and so then we get the thing that we wanted to say, and so you can do the same thing like here when we're getting to a one plus a two comma b one plus b two. Um, see that'll work here when you want to add these things. That works because uh, that's the, the, it works in R plus R, and then we can just dump the b one plus b two, and and we get to everything working out the way we need to, and then we can recover uh, the b one over here and the B2 over here, we can recover. Okay. And so we do that, uh, again, we can multiply these two together. Uh, we can get, um, this is holding in R plus R. So here, when you're doing this, you have to kind of recognize like what mathematical structure is this, uh, is this expression making sense in, right? So A1 comma B1 times A2 comma B2, that makes sense in R plus R, that's multiplication in R plus R that gives A1, A2, B1, B2 in R plus R. Then we apply that to M1 and then we use our equation here saying, well, you can dump the B1, right, B2, and then you can just treat this as a scalar, A1 times A2. And then we use the associativity here. That's what we needed to, that's, that's what we're leaning on. And then we uh, say, oh, well, this is uh, in the module and inside this parentheses, we can reuse this expression. 
And then we can uh, do reuse that expression again, actually. And we get basically what we wanted to get, right? So then you can just erase all this and say, well, we proved this. The same with the identity, okay? It's like this, it's like this, it's like this, right? Uh, so, so basically uh, what I wanted to th show though is that like, if your building blocks have the form R1C1, R2C1, when you apply all these rules, you're not gonna get anything with a different form. The stuff on the left has that form and the stuff on the right has that form. So all the machinery is not gonna give you anything new. So once you have a generator C1, yes, you can multiply it you know, using this R plus R. Basically, that's just using the scalar from R. And basically, you're not going to get anything more. You're not going to get any other extra generators, let's say, right? So since every element has the form RC1, it is straightforward to show they satisfy the rules for abelian groups with the zero element, zero equals zero C1, inverses minus RC1, well-definedness of RC1C1 plus R2C1 equals parentheses R1 plus R2C1. Then the associative rule. So now we're going into, uh, uh, oh, that's still the group. R1 and commutativity. Okay, so so these are abelian groups. It's going to satisfy all that, right? And that's what we need for a module. Okay. And so if we look at the elements RC1, that is an abelian group, which is what a module is. And it satisfies the rules for the modules, right? Okay, which is what a module is in the particular case, you know, that we're interested in. Now, are these simple modules? Okay, so here you do, this is the beginning of like basic, very basic, but um, uh, still always sophisticated uh, mathematical proofs. So suppose, so you do like proof by contradiction, typically. That's, that's one way, one style, I guess, that I'm comfortable with. So you go, suppose C1 had a non-trivial submodule. Non-trivial means it's not zero and it's not the whole thing. It's something interesting in between, let's say. It's which would mean it contains some elements, but not all elements. Okay. Well, if it's non-trivial, then there would be elements where R1C1 is in it, but R2C1 is not. Then remember, like everything has this form, you know, that it's a real number times C1. But you see R2C1. See, R2 over R1, uh, these are non-zero, obviously, otherwise they'd be zero. And so R2 over R1, you can do, and that's a real number, and you can multiply it. That's a scalar. You can scale like that. And so R2C1 equals R2 over R1 times R1C1. It's in D, but we said it wasn't in D. That's a contradiction. Okay, so that means that uh, it doesn't have a non-trivial submodule. Basically, like once you have M1, you're going to get all the real numbers multiplying times that, and you're going to get the whole thing. Now, how do you know uh, that? And this is, see, why am I making this video? Why am I learning these things? Why am I te teaching you? Because you're not going to get this typically from anybody else. Like anybody who really knows this stuff is going to say it's all trivial. Like there's nothing, to, it's obvious. Like there's nothing to talk about. Right? Like, or they're not going to understand this. They're not going to be able to tell you. So this is, you're in the rare case, like where I'm kind of like working through. I'm a mountain climber who wants to climb the mountain, but I've never been there before. So I have to kind of go up there. And so I kind of retrace certain steps, uh, maybe repractice some techniques, uh, make sure that my, what are the carabiners or, you know, my ropes are all sound, right? That I trust them. So we're going to climb here, not be ridiculous and or suffer mathematical misfortune uh, in our climbing exercises. So, um, now we want to show that these are actually two. And when we say two, we mean on, um, you know, two up to isomorphism because it's so easy to tweak these or just change your notation or do different things. We're like, oh, I've got many of them. No, we don't. We have, we have uh, are they the same form? And there's a question like, well, maybe how do we know that these two modules aren't the same? Because they actually function very similarly. You know, we're only proving this once. We're kind of assuming the proof will work for the other one. So what? What does it say that they're not the same? And uh, you really have to uh, be careful, like to say, okay, let's let's come up with an argument why they're not the same. So suppose there was an isomorph. Okay, so if they were the same, there should be an isomorphism from C1 to C2, which means that everything in C1 
matches up with something in C2 and vice versa. And we'll be dealing with an isomorphism uh, in that kind of spirit, you know, just very, very soon, as soon as we finish this. So um, let's just suppose there was one, right? Then, and we'll call it F. Then let's look at an element uh, M, and we have, uh, this is just general, like, so, okay, so things are looking like F of A comma B times M, right? A comma B is an element of R plus R. That's a scalar for our module. So if, if the module, and of course these modules, uh, they exist, they have a non-zero M, right? And everything looks like this form. Basically, like you can write everything in, in this form, let's say, right? So F of A comma B times M, well, you can pull that A comma B out, right? By the rules of modules. It's just like a scalar. A comma B times F of M. And then thus, what happens? Well, uh, F of A, M, oh, well, F of A comma B times M, you see, for in C1, that would be A, M, right? So we get F of A, M. But over here, a comma B times FM, that's happening in C2. The input is happening in C1. The output is happening in C2, you see. So the input, we're saying, oh, well, that's F, A, F of AM based on what happens in the input. But that would be equal to B times F of M based on what's happened on the output. And that's true for all A comma B, right? This is just generic. Um, so namely, F of AM equals zero for all A element of R. See, we could set B equal to zero, right? It's nothing to stop us from doing that. It'll still be true, right? But zero times F of M is zero. So F of A, M equals zero for all A element of R, okay? But then that map is taking C1 and mapping everything to zero. But then that's not an isomorphism because you have all, all these non-zero things here, okay? So that's an argument. And these are the, like, if, if you like this types of arguments, become a math major, you know, or, you know, get a master's in, in uh, math. You can go, it's really just about learning how to do these types of arguments and they're like little puzzles, okay? So these are the only simple R plus R modules up to isomorphism. That's what I say. We got two of them, right? Now, suppose there was another simple module, M, right? And then, um, And then uh, consider, okay, so then if it was an, another simple module, it's going to have a non-zero element, right? And then what we can do, uh, and there's always like a little trick like here. So we're going to write M equals 1 comma 1 times M, right? That's the identity. Well, 1 comma 1, we can distribute that. That's equal to 1 comma 0 plus 0 comma 1 by additivity. And here it's also by, uh, I think, by distributivity, let's say. So now, what's the deal? Can they both be zero? No. Okay, because if one comma zero times M is zero, and if zero comma one times M is zero, then zero plus zero equals zero, but we said that M was not equal to zero. So at least one of them has to be non-zero, one comma zero times M, let's say, right? So uh, let's just, uh, for the sake of specificity, right? Like, uh, suppose it is one comma zero acting on M. So then we build a submodule. And again, this is like proof by contradiction. We build a submodule saying, let's look at all the A comma zero uh, acting on M where A is the real numbers, okay? And that's isomorphic to C1, right? That's ex it's basically, it's exactly the same, or may maybe it is C1 in a certain sense, but if it's not C1, it's certainly isomorphic to it, okay? Has the same structure, has the same form. Well, we assume that M was simple. That means it doesn't have any kind of like component in it, which uh, would, would be uh, only part of it. And this is non-zero. So then it's got to equal the whole thing. But if it's equal to the whole thing, then it's isomorphic to it. 
Okay. And if it wasn't this one, then it would have been the other one, C2. So those are the proofs. This is the most abstract part of it. You can think of yourself as a math major uh, uh, inc incognito, let's say, if you've uh, enjoyed this, if you've uh, think, if you and certainly if you if you do this, uh, try it out for C2, let's say. Now we're going to look at this isomorphism. Uh, we have the Clifford algebra uh, split complex numbers, but we also have this uh, direct uh, sum, like how do we know that they're the same thing? Okay, because I don't think I actually have gotten that. How do we know that they're not just two different mathematical systems, right? So let's compare them. And so an A comma B, that's how we'll be writing these elements in R plus R, and an X plus Y epsilon one, that's how I'll be writing them in Clifford uh, uh, algebra. So the identity here, multiplicative identity was one comma one. And here for the other one, it's just one plus uh, let's say zero epsilon one. So we want these to match up. And now we'll do something um, just to uh, just by decree, I guess. And of course, you'll see it doesn't have to be the only way we can do it. It's probably maybe, but this is the, so the question is like, why this way? But we're looking for an element that would square to uh, plus one. So epsilon one, when you square it, you're going to get positive one, which is one. So that's by decree, let's say. So here we're trying to fish around, well, what would be an element which would give you, which would be different than this, but which would be squaring to one. So um, if we put both of these as negative one, that would work, but you see that would be in the same number system here. It's just negative. It would be basically negative one. And we have an, you know, if you multiply this by negative one, that'd be multiplying that by negative one. It'd be negative one comma negative one. So we, we don't want to go there. We want something new. So the way you get something new is that you have this be negative one, but this be positive one. Now, when you square it, you'll get plus one. Okay, and we're gonna say this matches up to epsilon one. It's rather arbitrary because uh, among other things, you could switch this around, right? This could have been the negative one and that could have been the one. And then um, I'd have to think about this, but you can start to wonder, are there other stuff? Basically anything that could square to um, uh, one, would serve it, where one is one comma one. So uh, actually, if these are real numbers, I think that's it, because uh, if you want two real numbers to square to one comma one, well, this one would have to be plus or minus one, and this one would have to be plus or minus one. So that gives you four possibilities, right? Four. So one comma one is taken care of, negative one comma negative one, that's the opposite of this. So the other two that are left are one comma negative one, we'll call that epsilon one, and then negative epsilon one would be the other way around, negative one comma one. Okay, so starting with this, how does this all hook up into an isomorphism? Well, so let's add these. If you add them, you'll get one plus one is two, one plus negative one is zero. So we'll need to divide by two to get one comma zero. And so then that's why this dividing by two is here. And this is what the sum is. So one comma one plus one comma minus one is two comma zero divided by two. That's what this is. And then you can match it over. Well, that'll be one half one plus epsilon one. And what we're doing basically was we're picking out this dimension, right? We're doing like what's called a projection, let's say, right? So that'll be similar to one plus epsilon one. It'll be analogous. And now if we subtract, um, we want to pick up zero comma one. So we want to subtract this from that. The ones will go away on this side, but then this will be one minus negative one. That'll be a two on the right uh, entry. So that'll be zero comma one. Of course, we need to divide by two again, one half. We have one comma one minus one comma minus one, as we were just saying. And then that'll match over. If you do all that, to one and epsilon one, you're gonna be getting one half, one minus epsilon one. And you see there's this symmetry and this is the kind of thing, like if you love mathematics, the beauty of it, you memorize these patterns, you see, hmm. So, and if you don't get nice patterns, you realize, make them look too good, you know, something's not really good. And so now what we can do is we can get the general form because once we have these two building blocks, right, um, we can, um, uh, at least for my type of mind, you know, so there may have been a quicker way to do this, but for my mind, 
I'm going to multiply by a, so then I'll be multiplying a comma zero is going to be analogous to a over two, one plus epsilon one, and zero comma b is going to be analogous to b over two, one minus epsilon one, and then we can add them, we get the whole thing. So a comma b, that's anything in r plus r, look like that. So it'll be a plus b over two plus a minus b over two epsilon one, okay? A plus b over two times the reals plus then a minus b over two. I mean, I mean, so times one, basically, like these are real numbers, but so... When you have something that's nice in generic in R plus R, it's going to map up with this in Clifford R in the in the in the split complex as, as written as Clifford algebra. And so uh, if you write a comma b and you're going to say x plus y epsilon one, you want to see how you cross over what would be the formulas, right? So you see the formula x is a plus b over two, y is a minus b over two. And we can solve uh, for um x and y, I mean a and b. So if you solve them, you would uh, multiply uh, 2 times x equals a plus b, 2 times y equals a minus b. And then you would add a plus b and a minus b. That would be 2a equals 2x plus y. So you divide by 2, you get a equals x plus y. Or to get x minus y, you have uh, a plus b, a minus b, and then you would uh, subtract a plus b minus a minus b. So the a's go away. b minus uh, minus b is 2b. Okay. And then you're dividing by 2 again because we had uh, 2x plus 2y equals uh, 2x minus 2y equals 2b. So you get b equals x minus y. So a equals x plus y, b equals x minus y. So now here, the x and y are nice, but now you see what it looks like x plus y, x minus y. And this is the whole point. This is why you can't just go x, oh, x plus y, epsilon one. Oh, I'd like it to be x comma y. I think that's what, that's all wrong. You're going to fall off the mathematical mountain if you do that. That's what we're doing here for. Safety first. So we've achieved a lot of what we're uh, striving for, which is to understand how uh, to look at the split complex numbers in different ways as a Clifford algebra. And we've just connected that to the direct sum, right? And we've also looked at it as a matrix algebra. But with regard to that matrix algebra, we want to understand that better. Um, is what would be the irreducible, let's say, uh, representations of that, okay? because it turns out that the one we got, which was very nice and very easily uh, gotten, and it swapped the dimensions and it all makes sense, but it turns out that that uses two by two matrices, but we can actually um, think of it in terms of one by one matrices, okay? So that's what this is. Maybe this is almost in a certain sense, uh, perhaps even the most sophisticated uh, part of this, um, how the machinery breaks up in a certain way, which you could kind of, I guess, maybe expect because it's R plus R, you know, the left hand and the right hand do not know what they're doing each other potentially, let's say, right? So let's ask this deep question. Uh, why are split complex numbers decomposable? And why are complex numbers not decomposable over the reals? Okay, I have to add that. So uh, there's a, slick way to do this, which is to look at the determinant of a matrix, okay? And so if you're not familiar with the determinant, um, it's a number that you can calculate given any um, given any uh, matrix, a square matrix. You can calculate this number and it reveals uh, like all the critical information, okay? The critical information being, so the number here, like in a two by two case, case you would just, it has two terms. The first one is you multiply the elements on the diagonal, x times x, and then you subtract um, the ones on the anti-diagonal, y times y. So x times x minus y times y. That's x squared minus y squared. That's a number, okay? Because these, these are all numbers. These are all real numbers even. So that'll be a real number. And that's the determinant, okay? And uh, if you're familiar with x squared minus y squared, then you see that factors, x minus y, x times x plus y. You can use the FOIL method, x squared minus y, x uh, plus y, x uh, 
minus y squared, um, the y axis cancel, you get x squared minus y squared. Uh, and this is the whole point of it all, is that this decomposes. Okay, and these numbers are turned out also be very important. They're the eigenvalues. The determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. So um, we'll um, we'll uh, look at that uh, and talk about that. But maybe just to kind of go uh, pay tribute to the Wikipedia page on the determinant. Basically, what's happening is that when you have a square matrix, this number, the determinant, is, uh, and I'm speaking as a combinatorialist, you know, so where, where it's, I mean, it's important in every branch of math, but it's running through all the ways of picking out a permutation matrix. Um, uh, so like you want to pick out an element from each column and an element from each row, uh, but they should not ever be in the same column or same row. Okay, so like you could say A and D covers everything or B and C covers everything. And then the idea is that, well, A and D, you're going to call that positive. And if you have to swap rows to get something like that, so like you can imagine swapping the A and the B um, rows, then you would get like something like B and C. So that'd be negative. So if you start with A, B, C, let's see, how do we know? I'm sorry, A, E, I, if that was on the diagonal, if that was your positive, then you could run through these. Um, and if you swapped the A and the row and the I row, you would get... Uh, uh, what we have here, G, E, C, that'd be negative, or they say C, E, G. So three of them will be positive. Uh, three of them will be negative. You get six all, that's three times two. Uh, that's uh, three factorial, three times two times one. And then if it's a four by four matrix, it's four factorial elements, and half will be positive, half will be negative. But when you add them all up, you get this number. And what this number is doing, it's basically... Uh, one of the things it's doing, it's explaining whether all these rows or you could say all these columns are linearly independent, which would mean, for example, how do you know? Well, like, let's say you're on a tabletop and you have two vectors. How do you know that those vectors are, are not pointing in the same direction, you know, and which basically says, like, how do you know that they enclose an area? so to speak, if you used, if you made a parallelogram, right? They don't just kind of collapse. Because if if they're pointing in the same direction, it's like, you're not really filling the area, right? You're just really filling a line, okay? So, um, and the way you know that here is you say, well, these shouldn't be multiples of each other, right? So like if C was 2A and D was 2B, then you just got the same vector pointing twice in the same direction. Or if this was negative A and this was negative B. So what would happen is that when you multiply like this, you would get zero. OK, like if D was equal to 2B and C was equal to 2A, you'd get uh, A times 2B and uh, B times 2A, subtracting 2AB minus 2AB is going to be zero. OK, so as soon as these line up, you're going to get zero. For them to be non-zero, they have to be not lined up. And determinant is the test for figuring out, like, are things going to be lined up? So now in three dimensions, how do you know that they're not in a plane, right? It's more tricky. It gets more tricky. Like, this was, we could do this basically in our heads almost, but this is going to be more tricky. And But so the same logic works, though. It will become what they call degenerate, right? Like, and that's why uh, zero, when these things square to zero, that means there's a degeneracy. It's not so interesting. It's not filling out the fleshing out all the space. Okay. So here, the split complex numbers, we have the determinant. It kind of factors like that. Now, the complex numbers, you don't swap. You, you, you also multiply by negative y, right? So um, if, you go, if we go back here, just to remember how the multiplication works, you know, 2 plus 3i, you got a negative here, right? Negative 3. Okay, in the in the split complex, it was just always, you know, if they're positive, they stay positive, but not with the complexes. That's why it's rotating around through the positive and negative quadrants, right? So when we're dealing with these, uh, here we are, complex numbers. So it's x minus y, y, x, okay? Now let's take the determinants. That's x times x is x squared minus 
y times negative y, it's a minus negative y squared, which is a plus y squared. So you get determinant of m is x squared plus y squared. And there ain't no way to factor that over the real numbers, right? But you can factor it over the complex numbers. So it, it would be x minus i y times x plus i y. But to do that, to do that factoring, you have to have the whole notion of complex numbers, okay? And so um, that's why complex numbers are really um, much more famous movie star, uh, you know, uh, heroes, uh, they're accomplished, uh, you know, they're, they're interesting because they're doing that. They're saying, look, you can't solve things like x squared plus y squared. You can't break that down. You need my help. Okay. Whereas this one saying x squared minus my squared, like I can break that down. It's yeah, okay, big deal. <laughs> so, okay. so, so that's the story. Why, if you wanted a, like a understanding, like why no one writes their PhDs probably on the split complex numbers, uh, that's the reason they don't. Okay. Whereas complex numbers are forever. Right? But in the Clifford algebra clock, though. You see, it turns out that in that environment, they are kind of like the, the siblings, right? And so in that story, right, like it doesn't end there. And if you keep going, it turns out if you keep going more steps in that way, adding more generators like this, you're going to be basically getting, I think, the same information. We have to think about that. But they become more interesting as you add more of them, okay? And then the dual numbers where you have this collapse, that's going to have like a zero here. And so you'll have a x squared minus y times zero, zero. So it's just x squared. Okay. And so then your eigenvalues will be, um, uh, I think it'll just be x, x. Well, the product of the eigenvalues will be x squared. Be a little bit careful uh, because the product, and this is not going not, not to prove this or show this, uh, but uh, because the product is uh, like this, there's this wish to kind of just assume that, well, x minus y is one of the eigenvalues, x plus y is the other. But I was just thinking, you know, it could be the product. Maybe the eigenvalue is one and the other one is the product. So I have to be careful. But, but in general, like you can see when it's not going to be zero, right? Like when would this be zero? If x were to equal y, right? then we would have x, 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 x. The whole thing would collapse, basically. The determinant would be zero. The things would be lined up. The rows would be lined up, the columns. Or if x was negative y, that would also give you zero, right? You'd have the same type of thing here. Okay, you would have a negative y, 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 negative y. Those are vectors pointing uh, in the same way. So we're going to actually solve for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That's because I like to do these kinds of things just for my own sanity as a mountain climber, right? We're going to check our ropes. So uh, an eigenvalue, an eigenvector basically saying like, eigenvector is basically saying like, if you have a certain um, space, and this is relating to this reducibility, or just like, how does it, how does the action break down? Okay. And so we're going to act and the matrix is like an action. And this is like a space that we're acting on. Is that the same thing as just uh, multiplying it by a scalar? Which means that we've picked a very nice space where basically, in a certain sense, not much is happening. You know, in the real case, it's just kind of stretching the line or it's like we've picked out, let's say you have a plane, you pick out a line, you could be lengthening that, like stretching that line or kind of like pushing it in, you know, but you're not affecting the rest of the plane. You've isolated. The whole point of eigenvectors is you're kind of like I isolating what your action is acting on, which means that your action is breaking thing, breaking, breaking up. Okay. So let's calculate this. Uh, then this lambda would be a real number, V1, V2 are numbers, and we want to calculate, like to see what we could figure out. So when we do the matrix multiplication, we're going to get X V1 times plus uh, Y times V2 equals lambda V1. So I've written that out here. X V1 plus Y V2 equals lambda V1. And in the bottom row, when we multiply that with the column, we'll get Y times V1 plus X times V2 equals lambda V2. Okay, so Y V1 plus X V2 equals lambda V2. Now we can start solving uh, for uh, V1 and V2 because we want to get rid of them. We want to just be left with X, Y, lambda. Okay, because we're going to want to solve for lambda. 
And that this is what we're doing here. So we take this, we put V2 by itself on one side, right? So here we'll have to subtract the XV1 and then lambda V1 minus XV1. Um, that's this, and then we divide by Y. So we get this equation here. V2 equals 1 over Y lambda minus X times V1. And then we use a second equation, which is going to relate V1 and V2, so we can start to uh, get rid of them, right? So we have... Um, this one will be very similar. It'll give us a V1, and we divide by Y, and then the X will have come over, so it'll be lambda minus X, and they're all both V2. Okay, so V1, you can rewrite as 1 over Y, lambda minus X, V2. But then we can plug in V2, because we got that from the other one. We got two equations. So uh, then we'll get 1 over Y squared times lambda minus X quantity squared times V1 equals V1. So presuming the V1 is not zero, we can divide that and we'll get one here. V1 divided by one is one and this V1 will go away. So we get one equals lambda minus X quantity squared over Y squared. Basically like lambda minus X quantity squared equals Y squared. We're gonna take the square root. And when you take the square root, you have to be careful that um, one or both of the things could be um, negative, right? Or positive. But you only have to worry about it on the one side, actually, right? So um, I think, so So we just uh, take the square root. So we'll go lambda minus x equals plus or minus y. And then we add the x on both sides. So you get lambda equals x plus or minus y, which means you have two solutions. Lambda equals x plus y or lambda equals x minus y. Those are these eigenvalues. Those are the special values that will correspond to these eigenvectors that will break up everything, okay? And so maybe what I should have done here even is I should have um, said, let's see, let's see if we can just do this here. I'm curious what V1, V2 would look like, right? So if V2 equals one over Y, lambda minus X, V1. So let's say lambda equals X plus Y, then V2 equals one over Y, X plus Y minus X, that's just Y and the y's cancel. So v2 equals v1, okay? So if v2 equals v1, you see, you're getting, and that's kind of like the line x equals y, right? Like it's a 45 degrees, but you're saying v1 and v2, that would be one way to break down the space. And I bet you the other one will be the, the corresponding one, right? Like that's it's a, v1 is negative v2. So let's try that. Let's put x minus y is lambda. So if lambda is x minus y, yeah, you'll get uh, x minus y minus x, so you just get minus y, and divide by y, you get minus one, so v2 equals minus v1, and that's exactly what it says, it's like the x equal, the y equals minus x line, so you get this crisscross. So you've taken your plane, you're saying, actually, you look at the crisscross, but it's not like y and x, it's the crisscross, right? So v1, v2, I'm mean, sorry, v1, v1, or v1 minus v1, those would be the eigenvectors that isolate this action. And when you isolate that action, what will happen is that, uh, so x plus y was the v1, v1, and the x minus y is the v1, v1 minus v1. But it's basically saying that this x, y, y, x has these eigenvalues. That means there's a way to write it out like this, where it's zeros on this, uh, which means there's no crosstalk. They're not affected each other. They're isolated. They're segregated. They're each doing their own thing. And what you have to do to do that is you have to change the basis, basically. The way you change a basis with matrices is you multiply S times uh, on the left, let's say an S inverse on the right, by this matrix that changes the basis. And actually, you can see the um, vectors right here. S, T, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, S, S, and T minus T. Those are the eigenvectors we just talked about, right? I made this calculation. And so this is the inverse matrix. So you just take the eigenvectors, S, S, T minus T. These are the eigenvalues. Here's the inverse. And so you can check uh, if you multiply out that this matrix times that matrix will give you one. Let me just do it right now. S times one over two S is one half. T times one over two T is one half. One half plus one half is one right here. Then S times one, uh, one over two S is one half. T times minus one over two T is minus one half. One half minus one half is zero. S 
times one over two s minus t one over one t, you're gonna get one half minus one half is zero. And then the last one, s times one over two s, that's a half, minus t times minus one over two t, that's a plus one half. One half plus one half is one. So you get one, zero, zero, one, that's the identity matrix. If you take this matrix, I call it capital S, and you multiply it by this, I call it capital S inverse. So this that looked so basic, it can be even more basic, basically. Basically speaking, it's more basic, okay? So that is kind of like um, where our mind is gluing together. So uh, we can take it even a little bit further just to look at what these matrix algebras look like, what these projections look like. So if we have this, you know, it was a very nice matrix. I didn't mean to um, show any disrespect. But and then we can remember, like, we can look at it from the direct sum point of view that this is a plus b over two, this is a minus b over two, right? You can plug that in. So now, um, let's see how this, okay, so you can go a plus b over two, a minus b over two. And one of the things you can look at is you can say, okay, well, how does addition work? Addition will get you something. If you have something in this form, right, like it's a plus b over two, a minus b over two, a minus b, over two, and you add another thing in this form, you stay in the form. Right, it's a plus b plus c plus d over two, and then a plus c minus b minus d over two. Right, something plus you have a plus here, adding a plus b and c plus d, and then you're subtracting a plus c, uh, and you're subtracting b and d. Right, and so you do it either way. You're submitting it form by addition, but you also do it by multiplication, which is a little bit more sophisticated, because when you go a plus b times c plus d over two times two. And then you go a minus b times c minus d in two over two. I've written that down here, right? You write it all out. Lots of some stuff cancels, right? Because the negative stuff cancels with the positive stuff. You're going to get a c plus c d. You get two of them, but you got four on the bottom. Two divided by four will give you two. So you're going to get a c plus b d over two. And now notice it's the A times the C and the B times the D over two. That's how the direct sum multiplication works. Do you remember that? And it's happening here, but it's also happening here. Uh, you do it with the negative. So you get A C minus B D over two. It respects the negative. Okay. So, and now what we can do, so it's basically the matrices are doing what the algebra, uh, uh, R plus R, if you think of it as an algebra, what it would do uh, adding, what it would do multiplying, that matrix form respects that. It's saying, if you have a matrix that looks like this, right, it's going to uh, it's going to respect that. So And so you're not looking at all the possible uh, two by two matrices. You're just saying there's a particular kind of two by two matrix, right? And it's two dimensional because it depends on A, it depends on B, but it's not four dimensional. Four dimensional would be, you know, um, L, M, N, O, let's say, or whatever you want to put here. And now we can take projections. So that'll give us like, how does it look like if we have um, B equal to zero, right? And that was the left projection, A comma zero, right? So, and then we can put A equals zero, we can get zero comma B, right? So let's just do that to see how this works. You get uh, the B goes away that we had here, right? The B goes away. And so you just have A's and C's. Of course, they add up. That's very simple. And then also you get uh, A times A over two times C over two plus A over two times C over two. That's AC over four plus AC over four is AC over two. So if it's the same thing, it's just simpler now because we zapped away a lot of stuff. And so you can have a two by two representation just like this of the direct sum, right? Using that notation, of course, we could use the X's and the Y's that we're using for the Clifford algebra. It's all working the same. It's all isomorphic. Uh, and so you get the same thing for the right projection, right? And then it's just that you've got these minus signs here on the anti-dynamic. Anti -anti okay, and so can we make this one dimensional? But basically it is one dimensional. So we make this one dimensional and this one one dimensional by sending it to um, A plus B and A minus B. And now I'm thinking that like if you go A plus B 
here and you have another matrix that's C plus D, C minus D, you know, and then the, the A plus B stuff times C plus D, what'll happen there? Uh, that'll be a A plus B, C plus D, A, C plus a, D plus B, C plus B, D. Hmm. I'm wondering if that's a representation. I figured it out. So what we have um, is the issues coming up um, in two different contexts. We have the... Um, direct sum, we have the Clifford algebra. So as John Bias said, um, in the case of the direct sum, R plus R, you know, we have elements, let's say A comma B, C comma D. These are just one by one matrix multiplications. You know, you have a matrix A, you have a matrix C. So the A is coming from A comma B, the C is coming from C comma D. You multiply them together like matrices, you get AC, right? And then that's that's going to be uh, A C comma uh, B D. It's the first term in A C comma B D. And similarly, the second one you get uh, one by one matrix B, one by one matrix D. You multiply them together, you get one by one matrix B D. That'll be the second term when you multiply this out. Whereas when we have the Clifford algebra. Uh, way of writing it out, which is how we talk about the split complex numbers when we define them. Uh, then, of course, you can multiply them out x plus y epsilon 1, u plus v epsilon 1, and then you multiply it out this way. Well, there's, um, there's, uh, you can multiply, you can take this two-dimensional element and you can represent it with a one-dimensional number. x plus y is a number. Right? There's no epsilon 1 there. And u plus v is a number. And you, when you multiply that out, you get xu plus xv plus uv, u plus u plus yu plus yv. And you can group them together. And then you'll get xu plus yv. Uh, and you'll get xv plus yu. And that will be... Um, let's see... Um, that will be the that will be what you get from the Clifford algebra multiplication from the Clifford algebra action. It will follow it, and it'll also work. I shouldn't have written this out. I don't think, but but uh, the point being that it'll also work if you have the minus signs. It'll it'll follow. It'll keep the same form. So maybe stumbling a bit on these rocks as I climb the mountains, but we did it. We described uh, the split complex numbers in terms of uh, uh, Clifford algebra. We uh, showed how to make matrix algebras of them. We showed the isomorphism to the direct sum. We showed that the matrix algebra is decomposable into simpler one-dimensional. So it's like a sum of two one-dimensional uh, matrix algebra. And that will mean it is a Z plus Z uh, when we work it out. That uh, Because... Basically, um, from the point of view of this machinery of bot periodicity, you have one irreducible representations. You could have lots of copies of them, right? And you have another irreducible representation. You could have lots of copies of those. So you have basically like two generators uh, for integers. And then what you do, what Grotendieck does is this trick to say, well, if we'll allow for negative numbers, even though it does not clear what that would mean. But, um, but basically, you have two generators. And then if you divide out by one generator, you're left with one generator, you're left with Z. That's the Z we're trying to explain why it existed, but we'll need more videos for that. You'll hope you'll watch more videos for that. Maybe you'll leave comments uh, and say uh, how we could work together. Um, and what you're hopefully seeing is that these two by two matrices can be very rich and they're explained and you can have matrices of matrices of matrices of matrices. It just builds up like that. I think it's cycling through the ways uh, that we can put our, our our minds can imagine adding more perspectives. That's the hunch. Uh, 
So that's exciting for me. And so further questions like, so how does this apply to the split by quaternions, the H plus H? And just briefly, I've started working on that, but it's basically very similar. Most of it is carries over directly. Maybe there's, a, you know, you have more dimensions involved because the quaternions are four dimensional. Okay. So I have to figure out that. And then calculating. Um, we we'll have to think about the Z2 graded representations. I spoke a little bit about that, but how do you focus on the even uh, the generators, uh, even numbers of generators, zero, two, four, six, let's say generators. Here it was only zero and one, but so here we would, let's say, knock out the one. What are we left with, right? And then uh, how do we calculate the group relevant for bot periodicity? I just said that. What happens when we replace real numbers with matrices of real numbers? And so basically that should be basically the same. They could be eight dimensional real, um, I mean, eight times eight, let's say, matrices uh, at 64 dimensions. Um, and then you could be adding them. So you could have two copies of that, let's say. And is that going to function? And I think basically it's supposed to function basically the same. So, and why are zero minus one, one key for Clifford algebras? That's probably good to think about. Thank you. Uh, and um, my peace and love to you. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, and he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And you know, I'm just I'm grateful, and you know, I I want to support that, and you know, our weekly or bi you know semi weekly or bi weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.